to our kind of neuro or bioelectrochemistry boot camp. Uh, this is summer group meetings for the Venton Lab that I'm uh, videoing as well. Uh, and so today, we're just, day one, we're going to start with some uh, newer concepts, uh, or sorry, sorry, some fundamental concepts of electrochemistry, um, and then hopefully uh, by the end cover amperometry and chronoamperometry. So we're only going to talk about a few techniques um, as we go along uh, here in the uh, boot camp. And the only techniques that we're going to talk about uh, for electrochemistry fall under the um, guise of voltammetry. So in voltammetry, we basically this is a bad marker, uh, apply a voltage, that's better, and then <laughs> measure a current. So again, there's bunches of other um, uh, electrochemistry techniques that um, exist out there, but in like the neuro kind of world, we don't do anything but apply voltage and measure current. Uh, and so those are all voltammetry techniques. So even amperometry, which I'm going to cover today, is a voltammetry technique. Um, right. And so the first question we're going to kind of ask. Um, Um, we're going to ask today is the, is the question of why would a molecule be oxidized, right? You know, we kind of got to start with the fundamentals of, you know, what causes an, a molecule to be oxidized. So all molecules, right, have some sort of molecular orbitals. Uh, and so you have these kind of molecular orbitals, if you think about a molecule, right, there's these molecular orbitals. In general, we'll think of energy as being that sort of axis, right? So we have energy that's kind of increasing, and the molecule, depending on its structure, will have electrons, right? And they'll occupy kind of the lowest orbitals, so to speak, and then you'll get to a point, right, where you have unoccupied orbitals. Um, and so this is, again, the, the energy level of these things depends on the molecule, but the overall thing of every molecule will have this. They'll have some occupied orbitals, they'll have some unoccupied orbitals, right? Um, and so what we're doing for electrochemistry, I'm going to put a little dash line here. This was my analyte or my molecule, and this is my electrode now, um, is that we've got the ability to kind of change the... Um, uh, change, in this case I'm going to make it an occupied one, uh, where you got the ability to change the energy level of the um, electrons over here, right, by how I apply a voltage, right? So as I apply a voltage, I can shift this up or down, right? Uh, that's the general concept. Um, if you were to look up the electrochemistry book, and I'm going to do it like the electrochemistry book, um, the actual um, uh, uh, thing here would be uh, for a reduction, and so they'd actually have you be going more negative uh, as you go up. And so basically, we need to get my electrode, uh, so I'm going to erase that. I need to get this energy just a little bit higher, right, than that unoccupied molecular orbital. And when I do that, then I'm able to transfer an electron over here. Right, so I have, so this energy needs to match up with that orbital, basically. Um, and so this is, we won't go into, because I, and I'm not even very good at it, uh, you know, what kinds of functional groups give you what kinds of orbitals or whatever, but, you know, the functional groups of the molecule determine where these orbitals are set. And again, the basic concept is you've got to match the energy levels, right, to be able to do the thing. So in this case, um, the electrode is giving um, the electron over, as I said, and that's a, to the molecule. Uh, that's a reduction. You can, um, you know, write a similar sort of diagram for oxidation. Um, and here, you know, I'll just give it again good old occupied molecular orbitals, but here we'll be taking the 
energy of our electrode, and again, in this strange conventional electrochemistry where sometimes we do things backwards, would be going more positive, would be going down in this case, and we need the electrode to be a little bit lower than here, right? And then we could take, and we could transfer, I transferred the down one, so I'm going to get the down. Uh, um, uh, we could transfer the over there. So again, we've got to line up here with it being occupied, so now my analyte, my molecule, is going to give an electron over to the electrode. Um, again, this is a really, everyone here has finished their oral exams, but this is a diagram that I often tell people, if people are like, why is something oxidized to reduce? This is a great diagram to bring out, uh, because it's like a fundamental property of the molecule. But it's actually also a fundamental property of the electrode. Uh, so I'm giving the electrode good old one energy level here. Uh, but the reality is you actually would love if the electrode had a bunch of orbitals, right, to take on things. And so occasionally when we're talking about electrode design, you'll hear a concept called density of states. Uh, and that density of states just kind of usually means many molecular orbitals, but they talk about that sometimes in carbon or carbon nanomaterials. Like you want a high density of states, right, uh, for your a to be able to have lots of molecular orbitals that can accept a um, electron or eventually give an electron. So that's all about electron transfer, and so um, so as I said, these energy levels are dependent on. Um, uh, um, uh, the structure of the molecule. So that leads to the question, can any molecule be oxidized or reduced? The answer is theoretically yes, right? Uh, and so you're like, if you've done biological electrochemistry, you might think, no. The answer is no. I know that many molecules don't do this. Huh. And then you're like, but like just looking at this diagram, why yes, right? And so the answer becomes what is the limitations to us doing biological electrochemistry? Because if you can go to the right voltage, you should be able to get above the occupied ones over here to do a reduction. Or here, if you could go to the right voltage, you should be able to get to a place where you could oxidize them or reduce them. So there's the, the concept is there. But in practice, many molecules aren't able to be oxidized or reduced. So what's the problem? Uh, so the problem is that we have limits to our electrochemistry. And so for our biological electrochemistry, which is all I'm teaching in this little uh, boot camp type course, uh, the limits are, so on the reduction side, on i.e. Our, our negative potentials, our limits end up being that we don't want to reduce oxygen. And reducing oxygen starts at approximately about 0 0.6, my, sorry, minus 0 0.6 volts. So we don't ramp typically down to like minus 2 or a minus 3, right? We don't do that. And you, uh, you probably already know why we don't want to reduce oxygen. Um, that you can think about when we do that, you make a lot of kind of like oxygen free radicals, oxygen byproducts. Also, we do not work in deoxygenated solutions like an inorganic electrochemist. Thus, you get huge signals. There's a lot of oxygen in our buffers and in the brain, right? So there are times we want to detect oxygen in the brain, and then we'll go down to these, you know, for a brief, like, scan. But you don't want to do this continuously. You don't want to make all those products. That's a bad thing to do. So on the oxidation side, we also have limits. So as we go higher to higher potentials, there's limits as well. And here, it's the oxidation of water. And so the oxidation of water at our carbon 
electrodes generally happens uh, at about 1.5 volts or higher. Actually, that's one of the advantages of carbon electrodes is that they have what we call a high over potential for water oxidation. At some electrodes, this would actually happen at a lower potential, but water doesn't love to oxidize in carbon electrodes. So that's just what sets the limits. We can go from about minus 0.6 to 1.5, and that's it. Um, and so there are molecules out there that could probably be oxidized or reduced, but we need to go to 2 or 2.5 volts or whatever, and then we'd be oxidizing all the water, and you get such a big background compared to the one little molecule you wanted to see that it wouldn't work. Um, and so I just want to say that, you know, theoretically you could oxidize or reduce every molecule. Practically, we've got limits, and these are the limits. So as you learn some of the fundamental experiments, if you're new to the lab, these limits are kind of taught to you. Maybe not because, maybe not why, though. Right? They'll be like, oh, don't scan past 1.5. Or, oh, we don't hold much past minus 0.6. Right? Um, they're intrinsically, our experiments are designed around them. But you don't always, people don't always know, oh, that's the reason um, that we have um, a limit. Okay, so let's look at um, our favorite biological molecule in this lab, where everybody starts, right? And so we're just going to look at dopamine. Um, um, all right, so this is our favorite biological molecule to learn electrochemistry off of, which is dopamine, right? And so as we look at what happens to dopamine, again, I want everybody to be really good on their oxidation and reduction terminology. We have first oxidized dopamine. And so when this molecule is oxidized, again, like the diagram I just showed you, in this case it ends up losing two electrons, and for charge density it also loses two H pluses, and then we end up with the orthoquinone species. That's why there's chem draw, because my drawing's not that great. Um, Right, but as we lose electrons and we lose the hydrogens, right, the two hydrogens that were there, right, that keeps it charge balanced, and um, this is how it looks. Um, there's a lot of electrochemists that if they look at fundamentals, they'll look at reaction mechanisms. Turns out it's possible to lose the electron, then lose the hydrogen, or it's possible to lose the hydrogen, then lose the electron, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We're not going to get into that. Uh, but, you know, it would be two steps, right, losing two electrons. Uh, so whenever we look at any and fundamental equations for dopamine, there's often a little n, and n is the number kind of, of electrons that you're using, right? So for dopamine, n is equal to 2. <laughs> so, you know, just, you know, get that in your head. So it's not one electron, right? It's two. Uh, so um, I'm not going to go super heavy on equations today, but I'll put up a few, um, right? And so whenever you see that little n, that's going to be number of electrons. That's going to be two. Um, of course, we can go back the other way, right? Once we make this, if we went back the other day, we never show this, right? But it would gain two hydrogens and it would gain two electrons, right? And that would be the reduction reaction back. And again, if you're new to us, this species is called dopamine orthoquinone. Okay. So this is our favorite reaction, right? And um, the formal potential for this reaction, if you looked it up in a textbook, would tell you that E0 for this is approximately 0.2 volts. We won't do much with that number today, but when we get back to fast scan cyclical telemetry, if you've done fast scan cyclical telemetry work, you'll realize that we do not see the potential at 0 0.2 volts, right? It's shifted higher than that. But we're going to talk about amperometry today, and the reality is 0 0.2 is really about all you need to do an amperometry experiment, uh, should you wish um, to do that. Okay. 